Please like and subscribe to our channel and click the bell icon to get new video updates. I don't know how many of you know anyone who has cut up a human brain. Um, I, I, I graduated from college and after a year I finally got my dream job as an adolescent psychologist and a uh, child psychologist in a, in a private treatment center for adolescents. And, and uh, it was not only that, my girlfriend from five and a half years and I decided to get married and then we put a down payment on a beautiful a little farm in Bridgewater, Massachusetts, and my life was absolutely perfect. Um, that lasted for a month. <laughs> the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts lost its wealth, and all of the schools were closed, and I lost my job. Uh, it was, uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. I went back to the state hospital where I had worked for a year in the occupational therapy department in the hopes that uh, a job would open in the psych department. It never did. But um, uh, the superintendent, Dr. Mora, was, was glad to have me back. He was wonderful. And he said, I'm sorry we gave your job up. But, you know, there's a job I think you'd like. Um, and it's open because nobody wants it. <laughs> that sounded incredibly appealing. <laughs> but I needed a job. Um, he told me that uh, while I was gone, they took all of the older people who lived in various backwoods in the hospital and m moved them all to one building. Uh, it was the new geriatric unit, and uh, I, I said yes, and he got me some keys, and I, 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 as I walked through that mile-long tunnel onto Chestnut Street on the way to Dexter Building, I felt like, in the words of John Updike, that I'd given birth to a black hole. Uh, I opened the door of the ward, and I don't think anybody who's ever been there will ever forget the smell of a back ward in a state mental hospital in the 60s. Um, the first person I came upon was this beautiful woman with tight, curly, silver hair and, and fire in her eyes. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I leaned over and I said, good morning, my name is Warren. And she looked up and she, she said, my name's Mary. And she burst out laughing. And I laughed too, and we talked for a little bit. And what I didn't realize, I couldn't feel it, but the Teutonic plates in my soul and my body were moving and, and reshaping in, in the most amazing way. The next person I came across in the bed was a. Uh, she was looked like she was in a coma. Her hands were totally contracted uh, to the point where her fingers nails were growing into her palms, and her hands were infected, and her eyes were clamped shut, crusted shut with like blepharitis. And uh, but I learned early on that you always, always talk to a person as though they are 100 percent there and and special. And uh, so I leaned over and I said. My name is Warren. Good morning. And now she told me later that she loved to eavesdrop, so she already knew my name was Warren. But <laughs> she, she, she turned her head and, and she said, in this little high squeaky voice that was very quavery, which I grew to love so much, she said, Good morning, Warren. And I said, oh, Wow, I'm so glad to meet you. She said, I'm glad to meet you too. Will you open my eyes? Oh, I was terrified. I didn't know how. And I told her that. And she said, no, of course you do. She was so encouraging. She said, just go in the bathroom, get a little cloth, put some warm water on it, put it on my eyes. It'll pop them right open. <laughs> and I did what she said. And uh, the, I opened one eye and, oh my God, she had these gorgeous blue eyes. And she looked at me with one eye and she said, there you are. <laughs> she had the most incredible sense of humor. And... Uh, I was changing, and I didn't know it. I was going from one world to another, and I had no idea. I got up to the nursing station, warm welcome for the nurses. They were so glad I, someone had taken the job. And I pulled, pulled the first chart, and it was Mary's. And um, oh my God, I, I'm still shocked. She was 107 years old. She was born into slavery in South Carolina. And I will never be able to thank her enough for what she has done for me in terms of how much she's changed me. Um, the second person, um, Annie Eliasson. Uh, the social worker wrote wonderful notes on each person. Sarah was such a good social worker. And she, she said um, that Annie was a, neither woman had, had any family. But um, um, Annie was a concert pianist. 
Well, I learned about her. Uh, every morning, I, I just loved going. I loved these people. You, you, it sounds unprofessional. You're not supposed to love your patients. But, you know, between you and me, I think it's unprofessional if you don't love your, the people you work with. And I... I thank you. I... I come in 20 minutes early every morning, and I'd soak Annie's hands in warm water, and I very slowly tried to bring her, pry her fingers open without hurting her, which was very difficult. It took two weeks to get her fingers open wide enough so that we could finally clip her nails and the nurses could medicate her hands. And then they, they worked with her eyes, too, and resolved that problem, and she was doing well. Um, I, I loved coming in. Uh, every morning she would tell me about Europe, and I, I couldn't believe that those gnarly, twisted hands had danced across keyboards all over the capitals, uh, major capitals of Europe. Um, I, I loved the stories about Europe in the 20s and the 30s, and one day I went in and she said, you know, I've been thinking a lot, and last night I made a decision. I said, what's that, Annie? She said, well, uh, before you came, I, I didn't really have a future, but I think now I do, and I've decided not to talk about the past anymore. Oh, I was so disappointed. I, I loved the stories. <laughs> and I said, what are you going to do, Annie? She said, well, I'm going to be your spy. <laughs> and I said, my spy? What? what? She said, well, you know, there are things that happen around here. You know I love to eavesdrop. And I, I hear things and see things now, but uh, on the weekend or at night, and if you knew about them, you, you're the kind of person who could do something about it. And imagine if we work together, we could really change this place and make it better. Well, it sounded great to me. Uh, let me give you an example. I went to a, uh, worked with her one morning, one Monday morning, and then I rushed down to rounds, and the nurses were reading a report, and, and they were lamenting the fact that this, there was this woman who, every so often, she'd have these episodes of, of terrible, terribly disturbed. She'd be all upset. She was nonverbal, so she couldn't tell anyone what was wrong. It was so sad. And I knew what was wrong. Annie had told me that the night before, she was eavesdropping, and her, the family had come in to visit this woman, and and when the nurses left, um, the family very severely verbally abused this woman till she just broke down. And, and uh, I said to the nurses, um, gee, maybe there's a correlation between the visits from the family and the fact that this woman gets upset, because I, they couldn't know that Annie had told me. And uh, they said, oh, gee, maybe we'll look. Well, that was the last time that woman was ever abused. And Annie and I helped ever so many people, so many people, but really, she helped me more than anything. Uh, she was so encouraging, and she said, you have to go back to school. And I knew she was right. Um, and I finally enrolled in Metropolitan College at Boston University, um, an occupational therapy. It was a renowned, uh, Alice Schaefer, she's a renowned occupational therapist who taught this course in consultation in nursing homes. Now, I have to tell you, this is a stretch for someone who is an adolescent psychologist. But um, I loved it. I loved it. And I, I, would, I would come back in the morning and I'd tell Annie, it was an evening course, I'd tell Annie about the class that she had a million questions. What did you learn? Tell me what you learned. And she was so encouraging. I finally applied to Boston University and was accepted at Sargent College in the OT program. And when I told Annie, oh, she, was, she said, oh, by jingles, that is great. <laughs> you know, no one uses the term by jingles anymore. I wish they did. But... Um, Three months after I began the program, I got a call from Sarah, the social worker, and she said, Warren, I, I thought you'd want to know that Annie passed away comfortably in her sleep last night. Um, I went to the funeral. We interred her at Papa's grave on Cross Street in Foxborough, um, and we stood there with Sarah and myself and the grave digger and the chaplain, and that was it, although I didn't leave her there. Uh, she's here with me right now at the, at the stage of the... Cutler Majestic Theater. Um, I had a hard time with neuroanatomy at school, and I called the state pathologist, Dr. Flashman. I knew him, and I'd worked a little with him, and I said, if I came in the summer, and, and it, it, could you, I'd help you out and volunteer, but could, in the meantime, could you teach me neurology, neuro, neuroanatomy? And he said, oh, that would be great. I'd love to do that. Come on in tomorrow. So I did, and... Um, he, he did the most precious thing. He held a, a, a human brain in his hand. And he said, before we start, I have to tell you that there once were memories in this tissue. This was the remnants of a person's personality. 
it is a sacred object, and you have to treat it with deep reverence. Don't ever forget that, and I never would, nor would I forget him. And he, he made a little machine with a wire that we cut the brain up into quarter-inch uh, slices like a tomato. Um, now they call, I think they call it an MRI, and you don't have to kill the patient to do the research. <laughs> but um, he would hold each, each slab in his hand, and then he'd, he'd describe the different structures and their functions, and that was wonderful. And then he'd, he'd, he'd write down for himself any anomalies that he'd see in the tissue, never knew who, you know, who, who the patient was. And he'd put the whole thing together, or I would rather put the whole thing together, it was part of my job, and I'd tie it up into cheesecloth, and then I'd very, you know, slowly and deliberately lower the brain into the uh, formaldehyde. We had these large mayonnaise jars from the kitchen. They were perfect for this. And I screwed the top onto the mayonnaise jar one late August, very hot August afternoon, and I turned the, the, the jar around um, on the shelf, and there on the two-inch masking tape was the name Annie Eliasson. And I had re I realized I had just cut up my friend's brain. I'm still shocked at my reaction. Um, I wasn't sad. In fact, I was overwhelmed and, and overjoyed. I, I, I just, all I could think of was if her being there and saying, oh, by jingles, I am ever so glad you did that. <laughs> oh, what did you learn? Tell me everything you learned. Um, uh, she was wonderful, and she changed me forever, as did Mary. I had a, a board member um, years later when I ran an agency on aging, and from 90 years of wisdom, um, she had lost her best friend, and she actually came back to work as a volunteer after the funeral. Uh, I, don't, I can't imagine losing a friend after 90 years. And, and I, said, I said, Margaret, what, what, was, what was your friend like? And she kind of looked up into space, and she smiled. And she said she was like someone you'd put on a gold chain and, and wear around your neck. And for the rest of my life, I've had this invisible gold chain in honor to people like, like Mary and Alice and, 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 and uh, Dr. Flashman and some of my students, Sean and Micah. And, uh, 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 oh, my God, my, my family, people uh, sometimes that I just meet, uh, like Jennifer Hickson is on my gold chain. Uh, you know, the, 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 what you do, if you don't know what to do, you just braille that invisible gold chain, and they'll tell you what to do. And together, you can make the world a better place. Thank you.